Hello, everybody! Hello, my name is Paul. Welcome, one and all. Wow! It doesn't feel like we got a lot accomplished in the last part because it was so talky. Hello, my little flat-faced friend. But actually, we did. We got a lot of long conversations out of the way, and that's important. So let's continue on down the track. But, oh, wait, we haven't, even, we haven't really looked around here yet, have we? Because every time we come in here, there's a big, long conversation. But now the conversation's over. We'll never see Beauty or Beast ever, ever again. They will live happily forever after in that castle until Silver Lining happens, where it ruins everything. The path ends here at a circle of hedges. An iron gate leads to a maze of hedges. The hedge continues back towards the castle and forms what appears to be a maze. I was always kind of bummed out a little bit that you could not actually go into the maze when I was younger. But the fact that they would make this maze and design it and make it look like a maze, that's probably, knowing these people, solvable if you look at it from the top. But they went through all that effort, you don't even do it, but... Uh, King Swiss 6, I love you so. Beast's Castle has a different, more welcoming air as the bridal home of Beauty and her prince. Oh, I could have looked at it before and I would have said, oh, it looks dark and foreboding and ugh. The path ends here at a small clearing. A gushing fountain dominates the clearing, and an iron gate leads off into a maze of hedges. In the distance, a castle stands out majestically against the sky. A fountain in the middle of the clearing bubbles with fresh glittering water. Water. The fountain gurgles thoughtlessly. Oh, how selfish of you, fountain. The gate doesn't answer Alexander. There's no one in the hedge maze to answer Alexander. The path silently proceeds ahead, heedless of Alexander. Alexander's voice only gets lost in the hedge maze and never reaches the castle. All right, that's kind of a cute way of saying it. All right, and off we go. I don't think we have any more business on the Isle of the Beast ever. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, oh, oh. I am Alexander, dancing through the water. La, 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 because I forgot something. Alexander takes a magnificent white rose from the rose hedges. I can't remember if we need another one, but I'm going to grab one anyway, because I can. And while we're at it, just to round out our collection, let's grab a red one. Alexander has not been invited to pick the family's roses. Well, apparently I can't, so I guess I'll have to live with an incomplete collection. Because I believe you can give that rose, or one of the roses, well, I guess only the rose, to Sing Sing as, I think, a final gift? I can't remember. Here you go, Singy. Alexander holds out the rose, hoping that the bird will deliver it to Cosima. Friend zone me, will ya? Here's a rose. Prove my love! Accept my love! The nightingale takes the rose and heads for the castle once more. Love me. A white rose. How beautiful. It must be from Alexander. <gasps> how I wish that I could see him with my own eyes. But Abdul will never allow it. He only risks capture by sending me these things. Dear to my heart though they are. Fly elsewhere, my pretty friend. Do not endanger Prince Alexander again by taking tokens from his hand. Forgive me, Alexander. And forget me. I cannot return your love for fear that I shall never leave this castle again. Oh, See, that gives us a little bit of an explanation and then leaves Alexander kind of forlorn. Alexander waits in vain for Cosima's nightingale to return, but the bird does not. Could there be something wrong? Or does Cosima simply not welcome his attentions further? It is kind of mysterious, but again, the game does a fairly good job of explaining that, you know, she's, you know, under better circumstances, this could work out, but, you know, I'm kind of busy dealing with my treasonous vizier and my parents' death and everything. So it actually makes a lot of sense and in ways kind of bucks the trope of the classic girl locked in the tower uh, thing. So I think there's a couple of things we can do with our current inventory. Uh, we have this piece of coal, which I can't remember how we learned that we need to use it, but we can. Because if you'll remember, over here on the Isle of Wonder, there was a little gift-giving competition between the queens. Like, one had a rotten egg, and the other one has something else that they wanted to give her, but it was kind of not as great. Alexander. But... For whatever reason, if you give them this lump of coal, it is a much, much better gift, and they will give you that rotten egg in return. Then honestly, I think that's the last thing we ever need on the uh, 
Island of Wonder. I think everything else is done. Oh, I lied. What have we here, you little mess of jagged pixels, you? There's a small bottle on the coffee table. It bears a label that reads, Drink Me. The bottle doesn't answer Alexander. Answer my questions. What are you? Alexander picks up the bottle. This is just like the Deus Ex garden here because everything you need to progress in the game, because it's magical and whimsical, just kind of appears. Yeah, uh, and this bottle will help us get the best ending in, of the game. The little bottle contains some sort of potion and bears a label saying, Drink me. That's rather forward of it. Now, I know more or less what this is for, but I'm curious about something. Well, I was going to try something a little bit fun, but apparently, nope, the queens need my attention right now. Your oh. Highness may as well spend her royal time contemplating something else. The lump of coal shall be sent to the Castle of the Crown oh, under that's my why. name. And that's all there is to it. No, it shan't. Yes, it shall. If the coal is sent in your name, I shall royally decree a ban on all red on this isle. You do, and I shall royally decree that white shall be henceforth used for all mopping up of cabbage stew. You wouldn't dare! Oh, wouldn't Oh, the I? petty politics of chessboard land. Oh, it's you! Have you thought of any more of those brilliant ideas of yours? I like how they come all the way over here just to argue. Now I'm going to try something while I have the game paused here. Because obviously you're supposed to give the white queen your lump of coal. So now they both have a lump of coal to give. But I'm going to try something. Because I think if there's two doses in this drink me bottle. Because you have to use it once to know what it does. And then you use it again to, uh, to do what it needs to be done. I might be wrong. But I'm going to see how they react. Alexander searches the bottle for a clue about the potion inside, but remains unilluminated. Well, maybe I just use it on myself like this. Alexander might offend the queens if he did that rather than paying attention to them. The game thinks of everything. Oh, my God. All right, I'll share that to you in a little bit. Okay, let's take the coal and give it to the white queen. First of all, can I do anything? Just talk to them? Perhaps you should allow your sister queen the coal and be content with the spoiled egg. Oh, perhaps you should keep your opinions to yourself. You did ask me. <laughs> Let's go, sister. I must go polish my coat. Is that a euphemism for something? Polish this, your highness. Whoa. Okay, ouchie, ouchie. Well, they're going to go off and have a mighty fine time, it sounds. Well, if you guys won't let me in chessboard land, I'm going to hold my breath until I turn blue. Alexander decides to swallow the potion in the bottle labeled Drink Me to see what happens. Yes, please do. <laughs> Suddenly, his vision fades to black. His lungs become too heavy to breathe. His heartbeat slows. Oh, so dramatic. Good night, everybody. Then beats no more. Suddenly, his heart takes a lurch, then beats strong. Where'd I get the lurch from to begin with? So it's basically just the, po the, the potion of reset, the big red reset button for your system. His chest heaves like that of a newborn. His vision clears, and Alexander feels fine. Phew. For a minute there, I thought, what if someone else had seen me and thought, sounds? Aha. Uh -huh. So, these guys don't care. I just wanted to see what would happen if you did it in their company, and they'd be all like, oh, goodness, I see you fell down, or you thought we were dead, but you got back up and everything's cool. Well, you're still not allowed inside, and we're still horribly racist and xenophobic. Bah. Okay, good. And I was also afraid that it was a one-dose-only thing, but looks like it's still got enough in there. Let's, uh, let's go try this out some other places. But first, let's go ahead and give the coal to the princesses. If I leave and come back, will they just arrive again? Give me the lump of coal, your highness. I won't, your highness. You shall give it to me. That's my decree. And I decree rather not. 
See there, my decree is more recent than yours. Then I decree again, hand it over. And I decree further, your highness shall never have it. What is it that you want as if we weren't busy enough? Look, I just walked in here. You have no reason to come over and talk to me. It would be noble of you to give the coal to the White Queen, since she desires it so much. Don't be silly. She desires the moon as well. I suppose that should be given to her as well. I know I'm irresistible, but keep your hands to yourself. Never tried that before. Hands off the royal goods, young man. Uh, <laughs> okay, here. Here's my lump of coal, Whitey. You have it. I found the two of you another lump of coal Boop. so that you can stop fighting over the one you have. of coal. And what a beauty it is, too. Oh, marvelous. Now we can stop fighting, sister. Your highness can just keep the old lump of coal, and I'll take this new one. Quite right. That settles everything. As a token of our endless esteem and royal favor, please accept this magnificent and truly incredible spoiled egg. Uh, uh, thanks. Well, fare thee well and stuff. Let me see that lump of coal, your highness. Oh, the bickering never stops. It is a beauty, isn't it? Why, it's bigger than my lump of coal. Let me have it immediately. Over my dead body, your highness, it's my lump of coal, and it is indeed larger and much grander. Just look at that sheen. I demand you exchange with me immediately. Uh, well, I don't know. Da -da 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 -da. Now, there's no real reason for us to be here right now, but I'm very curious. What happens if I use the potion here? Will Ali actually have any kind of special dialogue if he sees me... You know, kind of die a little bit? Or will Alexander be all like, no, I don't want to waste it? Alexander already has a pretty good idea what that potion does. And he doesn't want to waste the rest of it. Hmm. Okay, alternate timeline. I now exist in a universe where I have not tried the drink once before. So let's try it now. Ali, do you mind if, uh, are we allowed outside food and drinks in your shop? Alexander doesn't know what that potion might do. And the bookshop owner seems a bit timid for a fright. Okay, that seems a little... Okay, not cool game. Let's try it out here. Does the bum have anything to say if I do it? Oh, God. Oh, beggar. Oh, help me if only anyone could... Oh, how about a free lamp? Ugh. I'll settle for 10%. His chest heaves like that of a newborn. Ah, uh, he called my bluff. Nope, the bum does not give a one tiny little shit. Now, I'm also curious about something. As long as we're existing in this alternate timeline, what you're supposed to do eventually is give him your old lamp and you can have one of the new ones. But since our lamp is full of reagents for the spell, um, will he still take it? Excuse me, peddler, but I have an old lamp that might interest you. An old lamp, and what a nice traditional design, too. <laughs> Take your pick of my new lamps. Apparently he will. Uh, let's see. I like the Chinese one. That's kind of cool. Ah, a fine choice, my son. Here is your new lamp. Good day, and I thank you, sir. Good day. Dread. Another dud. Nope, sorry. No genie, my friend. But, uh, come back here with my spell. Okay, well that just sort of put- I'm not sure that puts the game in an unwinnable state. I think you can still win, but, uh, yep, you definitely could have locked yourself out of one timeline. 
And uh, what I also kind of like is that each of those lamps, even though only one of them is useful, they all have their own individual little pictures, and the Chinese one's very pretty. Alexander has traded the hunter's lamp for a red oriental style lamp made out of decorated paper. Alexander rubs the new lamp, but nothing happens. And immediately tears it. Alexander calls into the lamp. Huh? Hello? Is anyone in there? There is no response. <laughs> Neat. So let's try another test here. As long as we're at it, let's see. Now, it doesn't really become a magic lamp until you cast the spell over top of all the reagents in the lamp. So here it is. Here's the make rain spell. Then uh, you say the incantation over here. Alexander prepares to enchant the hunter's lamp with the make rain spell incantation. Make rain! Clouds of thunder, shafts of light. Come and sup with me tonight. Bink. Waters three have I for tea. Brew a tempest now for me. I love the, the incantation is just making little swirly marks over his head with a little ribbon. The lamp in Alexander's hand gives a little perk. He hopes the spell works despite his makeshift teapot. Excellent. So now it is indeed a magic lamp, which you figure would kind of raise its resale value. Alexander is carrying an old, battered... The lamp contains what Alexander hopes is the completed Make Rain spell. Perfection. All right. This must be worth everything on your rack, my good sir. Excuse me, peddler. <gasps> nope, he does not care at all. <laughs> Alexander doesn't either. Okay, how about this little cylindrical one over here? That's kind of cool. Ah, a fine choice, my... Good... Good day. Alexander has no idea what an awful, life-changing decision he's just made. Spends all this time making a spell and then just gives it away. Drat! Another dud! Um, don't put that over flame, by the way. You'll get wet. Very pretty. Alexander's new lamp is long and narrow. It's open at either end, like a lantern, and is fashioned of flowered blue paper. So that's kind of a cool one. That's, I guess, a little bit more... I don't know, Japanese, I guess? It's still a paper lantern. Do they have those in India, maybe? All right, this one looks nice. Ooh, kind of red and bulbous, but it might look nice with some flowers in it. Alexander's new lamp is squat and red with a corked top. <laughs> there is a dick joke in there somewhere. Mm, let's see. I like this very nice traditional Arabian style. That looks like it might be kind of genie-ish. Oh, it's got uh, kind of double wings. Looks like eyes or kind of like a, like a gremlin teapot. This lamp is a small green metal lamp. It has handles on either side, resembling a sugar bowl. I just traded my magic lamp for a sugar bowl. Oh, I guess it does. Okay, I thought that was like a little handle and that was like the spout or something. Kind of recalling my teapot uh, rhymes of yore. And one thing I also found out, that if you click outside, you can just be all like, uh, you know what, I changed my mind. Um... I think I've changed my mind. I'm going to keep my lamp for now. As you wish, sir. Made me get up for nothing. And then I think things change if you talk to him again. Excuse me, pet. Well, we all change our minds, I suppose. Choose your lamp, son. There we go. And then, uh, well, this one also looks kind of, looks like just like the one I have. Oh, it looks like the universal symbol for wisdom from the Leisure Suit Larry... Six? Yeah, six. Alexander has traded for a new lamp similar to the Hunter's lamp. However, this one's spout is not hollow, but is made from a piece of solid metal. What possible use could that? Is it just purely decorative? That's enough for now. You notice I purposefully did not get one lamp because we'll see that one in good time. So now that we have the fully constructed Make Rain spell, which is activated by putting it over a lot of heat, we can go visit the Druids at last, and because we're put over a heat source, it kind of takes care of itself. And this is a Make Rain festival, so if they try to sacrifice me and then it starts raining, I'm the chosen one, right? I think that's the way it works. Alexander feels a strange pulling sensation. In his lamp. Eh, we've all seen that before. Let's cut right to the good stuff. Alexander starts to feel a little warm. The bottom of the cage is getting uncomfortably hot. And now that I cast the spell, this should be a bit different. Mercifully, Alexander passes out from the heat before the first tongues of flame ignite the wicker. 
You know what? I think in this new timeline, I forgot to cast the spell. Awkward. Okay, this is the real timeline. This is canon. The bottom of the ca this cage is really hot. Fire in the cage. Alexander pulls out Beauty's old slave clothes, desperate to beat out the flames. The flame is extinguished, but the clothes themselves burn to cinders. Alexander won't be able to keep the cage from igniting for long. The heat and movement must have jarred something. Something that Alexander's carrying is starting to jiggle around. Dangling participle, are you still in my pants? He gad, something's really percolating. Oh my lord, he's having a great time. The water in Alexander's lamp is hot. It's just about boiling. Alexander feels a drop. It starts to rain. That man is a powerful nature wizard. By the sacred oak, let him down! Tony J, your screaming voice does not sound great. I must apologize for our rude welcoming committee. We've been feeling inhospitable ever since the winged ones stole our sacred miniature oak tree. Besides, Wazir Al-Hazred sent a message that we were to watch out for a highly dangerous foreign assassin. I assume you are the one he meant. I'm sure I'm precisely who he meant. I assure you, I mean to harm no one. Unless that person threatens the princess. I'm sorry to have disrupted your ceremony, but I'm running out of time. What is it that you seek? The Oracle on the Isle of the Sacred Mountain told me I should speak to you about the Realm of the Dead. She told me of two souls in unrest there that I might be able to free. Free souls in the Realm of the Dead? You're mad! The souls might be able to help me on my mission to save the princess. It's imperative that I do everything I can. The risks are not important. No. And yet getting yourself killed will hardly help the princess. But I will tell you what I know. Legend has it that it is the right of any human to challenge the Lord of the Dead in order to save his own life or the life of another already passed. But the knowledge of how to do this was lost centuries ago. I have only heard of one who tried it. A young knight who came to the land of the Green Isles from a distant land long ago. According to the story, he was determined to challenge the Lord of the Dead for the soul of his dead lover. It is said that he tamed the Lord of the Dead's horse, a black-winged, demon-hearted beast named Nightmare. Nightmare sometimes flies to the human world to feed on certain noxious plants. Those unfortunate enough to see her are glad to escape with their very souls intact. Somehow, the knight captured Nightmare and rode off on her back, supposedly to the realm of the dead. But neither the knight nor his lover ever returned. If there was a means for challenge, it was lost with the knight. I see. Can you tell me anything about the Lord of the Dead? Ah, that is a blacker matter still. To the druids, he is Samhain, Lord of coldness and despair. Samhain was once a man like you or I, but he insulted the gods and was sentenced to rule the underworld. Immortal he is and mateless. Robbed of sleep, robbed of movement, robbed of companionship. It is said that he hates all mortals even more for the mortality that he lost. That is all I know. Interesting. I shall remember. Now look how the oak embers of our bonfire still glow hot despite the rain.
If you're bent on your course, you'll need courage that's just as impervious to the chill. <sighs> May your luck last longer than your storm, brave one. May it indeed. Thank you, Archdruid. So, this raises a couple of questions and a couple of, uh, a couple of statements, actually. Uh, first things first, you'll notice he mentioned specifically that the embers in here are oak embers, and we need that for one of our spells, which uh, we'll need fairly recently. And also, when you pop in here, uh, another new thing that happens is the thing catches on fire, and you have to beat it out with uh, Beauty's Clothes, which closes, haha, another uh, route for you, as it were, for the short ending. Now, I've decided, because there are two major endings to this story, uh, there's a couple of pure mutations thereof, but there's basically a couple of good and a couple of bad. We're going to go with the good ending for starters because I like it and it's better. But then I think we'll sort of take the TARDIS back and go through an alternate timeline where things go a lot more crappy for us. Where, uh, I don't want to spoil it, I don't want to spoil it, but you'll... Let me show you what really can happen first and then you can see the juxtaposition between the good and the bad and it'll be a lot better. I also question why the Druids need a rain spell on such sort of a rainy, foggy island. Uh, what was the rain for? Were you really desperate for a good harvest? Uh, it doesn't seem to be much growing here. Where's your apple crop? And another nerdy thing, like what they refer to as Samhain, as uh, the Lord of the Undead, uh, refers to a, a holiday or a tradition called Samhain, which is how you actually pronounce that because it's Gaelic, which is kind of like winter solstice or... I think it's like halfway between the equinox and the winter solstice, so it's kind of like a Gaelic, and then I think uh, a Wiccan tradition as well. It's kind of like Halloween in a way, kind of, sort of. Anyway, they pronounce it as Samhain. It's actually Samhain. Suck it. I'm going to grab some members in my skull. Alexander scoops up some of the red-hot embers in the ancient human skull. All right, that will come in to be important uh, quite quickly, as a matter of fact. The wicker cage that was to be Alexander's fiery coffin is now lying on the ground. Alexander is glad to be out of that cage. Alexander is standing in a circle of giant stones. He marvels at the complex yet simple design of the standing monoliths. Alexander is standing in the Druid's circle of giant stones. The rain festival has ended and the Druids have returned to their village to sleep. The bonfire still smolders in the center of the circle. The embers from the bonfire are still smoldering despite the rain. A gnarled old tree stretches a wide branch out over the smoldering bonfire. Hmm, probably a bad thing for self-preservation for this tree. The smoldering bonfire embers do not reply. Alexander has no desire to talk to that wretched cage. No, wicker cage. Pronounce it right. Sam Hain. The stone sentinels do not reply. The druids have left, and there's no one here to talk to. All right, well, that's about it, and I believe if we follow the druids back to their little home, I don't think we ever get to see them again, because they're all gone to sleep, apparently. The druids, exhausted after the bonfire festivities, are asleep in their treehouses. Alexander doesn't need to disturb them. Yep, that's pretty much it. I think, can we grab another coal, too? Alexander has already taken one lump of coal from the pit. He ought to leave the rest for the inhabitants of the tree village. Oh, there's hundreds of them. It's just coal for God's sake. So now, first of all, A, does that glowing skull not look flippin' awesome? Oh, that's so cool. Especially on the black background up there. Neat. Alexander is carrying a human skull filled with embers. The embers are glowing with heat. The skull is as silent as the grave. I'm curious also that if you carry the skull around long enough, will the embers die out? Do you have to go get new ones? I don't think so. All right. Well, the reason we have this uh, glowing skull, and I believe this egg and maybe the hair or the feather, one of the two, I think it's the hair, is if we look into the book here. Yeah, there it is. Charming a creature of the night, a skull full of embers, a bit of sulfur or brimstone, which egg is, I guess, kind of has a sulfurous smell, and a strand of pure heart of maiden's hair. We got that. And then we, in the presence of the speech, in the creature, then we do the spell. And I think that will be coming up quite shortly, because they mention Nightmare, who can take me to the realm of the dead. 
And that's exactly where we're going. But there's one thing I think we should do before we go. I don't think it matters when we do this. Let's uh, just pop into the pawn shop because we know our little uh, McGlintock likes to hang out in there. And we have something to, sh to kind of prove to him. Good day, Prince Alexander. It's also been a long time since you've been in here. Hello. Haven't I seen you somewhere before, sir? No! No! But I'm quite sure. Perhaps on some cliffs? No! No! Isle of the Beast? No! No! Dockside? No! Leave me alone! Not very friendly, is he? Well, he's admiring the bear, and it's a very interesting bear. All right, as long as we're here, let's see if there's anything else we can look at. Uh, these look like those fake sort of LED candles. Um, how about these barrels here? A few well-aged barrels probably hold assorted smaller goods and perishables. Alexander isn't interested in those storage barrels. But it's my night in the barrel. Now, I think him being the mint addict that he is, you can actually give him the mint leaf, but you need it later. Do you? I can't remember. Let's see what happens if I give it to him now. Alexander decides to offer the old man some peppermint leaves. Can I offer you some peppermint, sir? Mm, mint! Yum! <laughs> and there he goes. Never to be seen again. Uh, did I get a point for that? I don't even know. I don't think that's the right thing to do, though. Wait a minute. Because I think if I give the mint to the, uh, the shopkeeper, he can make more mints out of it. Would you be interested in making a trade for this merchant? I think not. I guess not. I'm going to hang on to it because I think I need it for something. But um, we're going to put on a little bit of a show here, a little bit of a pantomime, because we saw what the potion does. And we know McGlintock here will report anything that happens back to his boss. So let's just uh, let him know that, oh goodness, I have just given up on life. Alexander can't go on. Alexander suddenly gets a very sneaky idea. I can't go on anymore. Without Kasima, I'd just rather not live. Prince Alex, no. It's true. The Wazir has beaten me. I give up. Poison is my last resort. Stop. I love that sound effect. I am... no... more. Oh, right at his feet, too, you melodramatic soul. And the only time you actually get to see a full portrait of the, uh... Pawn shop owner. Well, no, he was outside once. Oh, what a waste. The poor young fool. He's dead. He's dead. Wait until Abdul hears. He'll be so pleased. yippity doo Now pay attention here. I told you not to pop in like that. You can learn to knock like everybody else. Sorry, Master. I couldn't help myself. I have great news. Well, what is it? Prince Alexander is dead. He killed himself in despair over losing Kasima. <laughs> what? Are you positive? That young man has proven to be most devious. I saw the whole thing myself, Master. He was really and truly quite dead. Hmm. If what you say is true, it shall be most convenient. You've spent enough time on that little irritant. We must start thinking about the wedding. Anything, Master? Oh, I do love weddings. Well, we do want you to look your prettiest, don't we? Oh, uh, foreshadowing. Now, Shamir Shamazel, to the lamp with you. Prepare yourself as we discussed. Ah, now, pay attention to that lamp he went into. Did you notice uh, its blue color? And for the Roland MT-32, you'd think they could have a better heartbeat sound effect. Prince Alex, but you, you were... Sorry, friend. I was doing a little acting, I'm afraid. 
Ah, of course, the strange cloaked man. You are quite clever, and a bit too exciting for an old man. And that's the end of it. Okay, just saw a miraculous resurrection, no big deal. All right, so that's how we know what the genie's lamp looks like. So let's go back out and uh, talk to this little bugger again now that we no longer have anything magic in our lamp. And it's the only one we did choose before. One of the lamps is made of blue colored glass and has a tall, thin neck and a cork-like cap. Can I look at this back? The lamp seller's pole bears six lamps. Each is shining with newness and each has unique characteristics. This is the one we want because it's a dead ringer for the genie's lamp. And there it is, aquamarine and turquoise. Alexander has obtained a new lamp made of blue colored glass with a tall, thin neck and a cork-like cap. Beautiful, that's the one. So now we can be even more devious and use this as sort of a ringer or a substitute for the genie's lamp. So we'll see what Jallo can do with that. Oh, the plot is certainly thickening around here. So now next time we have to go, uh, Pretty much go to hell. Yeah, we're going. Uh, we're going to hell, and we need to talk to Jallo about maybe infiltrating the castle and sneaking in and stealing the genie's lamp and using this as a rigger. Ooh, things are getting deep and political. I like it, and they think I'm dead, so they won't be watching out for me as much anymore. Hello up there. The woman seems preoccupied with her chores and doesn't notice Alexander. A woman. She has a mustache, though. That's that's a really big bushy must buy. Okay, and as always, I will do the same. Good night, Jelly Beans. Good night.